Hello and welcome back to Metatron's Academy. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about this idea that oftentimes as both not only language students, but also language teachers, we tend to speak of constantly. And that is the fact that, well, if you want to learn a language, you absolutely have to go and spend some time into the one of the countries that speak their languages. In fact, it's pretty much this idea of full immersion, trying to immerse yourself, surround yourself into the language, create a sort of experiential knowledge, a connection between the theory you read, the stuff that you study, and the stuff that you actually experience on a daily basis. You get to use the grammar structures that you're trying to learn, you get to use the new vocabulary you're trying to master. And by all means, as a person who has reached fluency not only in English, but also, for example, in Japanese, exactly through that. So I moved to the UK, picked up English, I moved to Japan, picked up Japanese to a level where I'm very confident about how I can, you know, if I just ran into a foreigner, and when I say foreigner, I should say like, either a person who speaks English or a person who speaks Japanese. I'm more than happy to just begin a, com a conversation. I don't have to. I don't worry about it. Uh, it's a nice level to reach. It's not perfection because, I mean, first of all, I don't think it's even possible to reach perfection. But regardless, I know there are speakers that are more talented than me. But I think I've reached a reasonable level both in English and in Japanese. And absolutely, I did it through moving to those countries and spending some time there. And therefore, even when I was a full-on, full-time language teacher, and that's what I was doing before the whole YouTube deal had actually started, uh, one of the things that I would pressure, I would sort of focus a lot, would be, oh, but absolutely trying to find a way to spend some time. Maybe move to, I don't know, you're trying to learn Mandarin, move to China for a year. You're trying to learn Japanese, you've got to spend some time in Japan. Or you're trying to pick up your English. Why don't you go to like Ireland, England, America? But usually from Italy, England is a lot closer and a lot cheaper. So yeah, I would always push this idea onto my students and my students' parents sometimes, because it really is the most effective and fastest way to fluency. And fluency is what we all want, okay? No one is starting a language just because you want to learn how to read it. No one is starting a language because you just want to be able to watch a movie or a film in that language. You all want communication, fluency, and a decent level. So this video today, however, is a video that wants to do a little bit of a reality check, so to speak, in the sense that, yes, moving to another country is a great opportunity and a fantastic way to reach fluency, but it's not guaranteed. And I have seen in my life several times people who spent over a decade in another country and they don't speak a word of that language. So how does that happen? And how can you prevent it or how can you guard from it? Well, the first item that I'd like to discuss when it comes to this is prepare before you go. I can't stress enough how important this is and I'm very adamant about it. If you move into a country without having any idea, without having even covered the basics of the language that you're going to learn, it's not that it's impossible before anyone types and says, oh, my, my uncle moved to my country, whatever, and he spent 20 years here and now he's following. Yeah, great. It's not that it's impossible, but it becomes significantly harder and the chances of the person actually ending up either quitting or just not reaching its full potential are extremely high. The reason being that if instead you have a preparation, I'll tell you how long that preparation should be, but if you have a certain level of preparation, you cover all the basics, you kind of have a decent vocabulary, not that you need to be even intermediate, you can be an upper beginner, but at least you have an idea of how the language works, pronunciation works, you've got, you've got some vocabulary, you have some understanding of the grammar, and then you move to the country, the speed at which you'll be able to pick up new vocabulary vocabulary, new grammar, new pronunciation, and in general fluency and confidence in the language is it going to be exponentially affected by this very simple idea of don't go there without having a clue of what you're on about. So how long should you prepare? Well, uh, it kind of depends on the language and it depends on the student. So to give you an average, I'm, I'm just looking average here. I normally tell my students that a preparation period of between six months to a year is optimal for you to be able to go to the country and make the most of that experience when you move there. But of course, these six to one year spam of time very much depends. There are a lot of variables that need to be considered. Let me give you a few examples. Variable number one, well, if I have student A and they can only spend one hour every other day into the study of language because they're very busy, either with family, with work or what have you, and then I've got student B and they're really passionate, they have a lot of free time and they spend five hours every day on the language and of course the level of time that they're going to need to be able to reach reasonable basic level overall understanding of the language is going to be is completely different. So that's the first thing, how long does the student have in terms of free time that they can dedicate into the language study. Second, the other thing that you need to consider is what their first language, because if you are a Romance speaker like me, uh, you're an Italian and you want to learn French or Spanish, just do three months and move. But if you are, so it's not only your first language, but also the language you're trying to learn, the connection between the two, what bridge, how big of a bridge do you need to build? 
between these two uh, linguistic worlds. Another example could be what if you want to learn Korean, Mandarin or Japanese or Arabic and you know you're actually an Anglophone or you are a Romance language speaker or a Slavic language speaker, whatever Hellenic, then in that case the bridge you need to build is going to be a lot bigger and therefore you're going to need a longer period of time, usually say at least a year and if you do not have like the ability to full immerse, it, you can also need two years of preparation. But perhaps you could do like one year, spend three months in Japan slash China slash what have you, then come back home, do another year, then move, stay a longer period of the time, like a year. That would be optimal, but it depends. It's a case by case. And for a student who can fully immerse, a year of preparation is plenty. Sometimes it can even be like eight, nine months of preparation is plenty to move and then make the most of, say, one year or two years in the country. Once again, case by case scenario. The second ginormous problem that I see so many people miss out, and please don't do this, is you have to avoid people who speak your language, so say you're English, avoid English speakers like they are the plague. Literally, Yersinia pestis bacterium, the black death. You've got to avoid them. What I see, and this is a matter of, I understand it's a psychological aspect of wanting to feel sort of, not, not necessarily pampered, but wanting to feel secure, safe, being in your safe space. But being in your safe space and not stepping out of your comfort zone and not trying to beat your introverted feelings, if you have those, and trying to gain an extroverted approach or outgoing approach to language learning is in fact one of the main problems. It's a wall, it's a barrier. And if you go to China, Japan, Italy, and you're English or American, and you just hang out with English people or Americans all the time. It's a waste of time, it's a waste of money, you might as well not have gone. Unless you're going for work and you're just making money in Korea, that's different. But if you're going for language learning, you have to avoid people to speak. When I moved to the UK, you want to know how many times I spoke Italian? Three. Within two years. Three times. I constantly use English, surrounded myself by English speakers, and literally used English from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed. This is the result. If instead I had spent most of my time hanging out with Italians, just making friends with Italians and feeling all safe, right now I wouldn't be able to make content in English on YouTube, I can assure you, and if I did, well, the level of quality of the way I present information would not have been the same, if anything, it would have been a shadow of what I could have become. So it is absolutely imperative to try and stay away from people who speak your language. Now given, don't be rude about it, don't be an asshole about it, don't be impolite. If you are, say, approached by a Japanese or a, or a Chinese person, then they are also studying English and they want to have a little bit of a tandem experience whereby when you hang out, you make it into a rule, you spend two hours together, the first hour you speak English, the second hour you only speak Mandarin. Yeah, that's fine. That's a, that's a mutual exchange and it can be mutually beneficial to both of you from a linguistic standpoint and also because it's always nice to have a friend who also speaks your language in case you are in an emergency, but they also speak the language of the, you know, the local language. Absolutely. And if it does happen that the occasional person, when they tell you where are you from and you tell them, like in my case, ah, Italia Gindas, I'm Italian, or 我是意大利人, I'm Italian, and they speak a little Italian to me, don't just reply back in their language because then it, it feels like you're being rude. Now give them a little bit, tell them a little bit, speak to them a tiny little bit, and then eventually, in a nice way, just maybe slowly go back into the language that you're trying to learn, maybe even tell them that you're trying to do that. So don't be impolite about it. You have to avoid is to spend too much time and to get too involved with people from your own country that speak your language and they're gonna kill, completely kill your progress. Don't do that. Anyways, these are the two major reasons why people can spend literally 15 years in another country and not learn the language. Now given, there will be situations in which people do that by choice. For example, you move to a country because you had to, because you had family members there, you went there for work, you do not care about the language, you do not care about the culture. Hey, nobody's forcing you to learn the language if you're not interested in, in it. But there are people that move because they want to learn the language and then they get stuck. And then after five, six, ten years, they still don't speak a word or maybe they speak it like a little bit and then they see this new kid he has been in the country for just one year and he's like 10 times your level of fluency and then you feel bad you're like why am I stupid why, why is he a genius no maybe you came into the country without any preparation and most importantly you just didn't hang out with the natives you didn't use the fact that you were there and you just expected to be magically infused by the language even though every movie you watch is in your language every person you hang out with speaks your language and you just don't even make an effort to try and learn it. You have to push yourself, but it can be challenging, it can be fun, it can be entertaining. I'm a very extroverted person, so for me that was no problem. Like, I would 
just go to the freaking mini market in Japan and start making conversation with the person at the counter. It didn't matter if it was a girl, a boy, an old guy, a gorgeous woman. It didn't matter. I would just speak to them, to all of them, and I would enjoy doing it. People could see that I was really having fun, and so it was fun for them too. And it, I always had a great experience with that, and it never was a challenge for me. But I understand that there are many different people, many different personalities, many different psychological aspects that go into these personal experiences. So I do understand that this is not as simple as it sounds when I'm when I, like I don't want it to, to make it sound like well it's so easy for everyone it's not I understand that but it is crucial because it doesn't matter what reasons you may have for not wanting to do this and, and kind of try and, and talk to the natives and the reasons the psych, even psychological reasons and personal experiences to kind of draw you or make you to feel more drawn towards just staying in your in your safe bubble because you will create a language bubble and those are extremely difficult to burst out of once you have created them if you're just hanging out with people from your country you have to also be honest with yourself what am i doing why am i investing my money my time my resources into this if i'm not willing to just step out of my own language bubble and go into the wild if you will and literally learn this language listen to me stay away from people who speak your language as much as you can within a certain level of politeness and you will thank me in a year when you'll be fluent in the language that you chose. Okay, noble ones, but as always, I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to leave them in the comments below. And as always, thank you for joining Metatron's Academy.